All right, well, welcome. This is the uh, third part of, of the program. This is the roundtable discussion on the future of NPE. So we're going to remove it from the debate format, unfortunately, since I was so entertaining, but I imagine um, the roundtable will be as well. Leading the roundtable discussion is John Sapola, heads the IP practice group at Kelphi, who, as I mentioned before, along with Benish, is a sponsor of this program. So I'll turn it over to John Sapola. Thanks a lot, Craig. Um, the question that we're going to talk about um, uh, in, in this discussion is, do you see NPEs existing in five years? Um, uh, and what I'd like the panelists to expound upon is not only whether they think they're going to be existing, but if, if, if they don't think so, why not? And if they see them existing in five years, what sort of formats do you see them taking? Do you see more lawyers getting into the business? Um, uh, as, as we've seen, do we see you know, venture capital money, more of that getting into the business as well? And something that particularly interests me is, do you see this expanding uh, into other countries? And do you see other countries' money coming into the United States to finance uh, NPE-type entities? So go ahead and kick it off. Uh, so we're, we're going to get out of the advocate's role now and, uh, and just try to be, uh, you know, predictive. So you have to, you have to, it'll be a little bit of a cognitive shift for you to realize that I'm not actually that super anti-NP. I was just trying to do my job here <laughs> <coughs> that they charged me for, charged me with. Uh, so uh, will NPEs be around in five years? I mean... Absolutely, and, and that, that is independent of even how you define NPEs. I really don't think that there's any question about that. Um, what I think the interesting question is, is you know, what, what form will they take? What will the trends be in five years? How are we going to channel this activity? And a lot of that depends on, uh, you know, basically I think two things. One, Eric mentioned there's a lot of work going on uh, w with respect to more sophisticated valuation tools. And in, in my consulting work, I've worked a lot on that, uh, and I've helped to develop some of these. And uh, I can say that I think the, uh, the, you know, the days when uh, litigation value was sort of the only um, uh, objective or independent value that was driving things, uh, I think that they are starting to fade. I think in five years we'll have a better set of tools that of course incorporate, you know, court-based damages, but that go quite a bit beyond because the, the higher the volume of the private transactions, uh, the more data we have independent of the litigated cases. And uh, the litigated cases might, might eventually look more like outliers as opposed to the, the sort of centrally informing, you know, cases that we look at. So that's the first thing. I think there's just a lot of private sector creativity going into patent valuation, which I think is a good thing. So then the second major, uh, I think, uh, factor that's going to affect NPEs is public policy. I mean, we've seen, I think, at the Supreme Court level, and we've seen indirectly uh, from the Federal Circuit uh, an interest in using the traditional tools, the traditional doctrines of patent law, um, to try to make sure that uh, we have high quality patents out there on the theory that uh, if we can rely on the quality of the patents and if the traditional patent doctrines are doing their job well, then we won't have to worry that much about, uh, you know, in whose hands the patents fall, right? And I think that will be reading the title, not to read too much into Judge Michelle's speech or Steal His Thunder, but it, it sounds like that's, that's sort of uh, a topic that he's going to talk about. But I think the other public policy angle, the one that we were implicitly pushing, was the idea that, well, maybe a separate regulatory level might make sense on top of or in addition to the traditional doctrine. So, yes, we want enablement to work. We want indefiniteness to work. We want written description to work. We want claim interpretation to be realistic. We want all these things. But what we were implicitly arguing was maybe an additional layer, something at the level of the FTC or the DOJ or or simply a doctrine of, you know, suspicious patent transactions or something uh, might make sense. And that, I think, is more up in the air. I think if the traditional doctrines are seen to be doing their work, if we rein in damages and possibly find tools 
some of them conventional tools to rein in some of the more egregious NPE activities, then we won't see the need for regulation. So, uh, you know, maybe a more aggressive use of the exceptional case language in Section 285, maybe more sanctions where an NPE or anybody is pushing an infringement theory that really is outrageous. Maybe a little bit more aggressive awarding of attorney's fees to the winner, uh, something coming a little bit closer to the British rule where, where loser pays, but more of a disincentive to file scattershot suits and more of an incentive to make sure that if you litigate, you really have something solid. So these are all the conventional tools that I think will will determine what the what the NPE situation looks like in five years. And if they're not working, then I would say that that additional regulatory level is much more likely. Uh, we're more likely to see it. Anyway, so that's where my views. Michael. I'll just take the, the cynical perspective as befits my personality from some of my past experience. <laughs> um, NPEs will definitely be around in five years uh, because even if we were to decide today we're going to regulate NPEs, we're going to stop the problems that NPEs cause. Uh, in five years, I doubt that we could reach at a, a even marginally suitable definition of what an NPE is. And even if we did, then the business model of the MPE is only going to evolve to fit outside that definition. We're lawyers, that's what we do. Um, but having been involved about 15 years ago with early discussions uh, in the semiconductor industry on trying to figure out ways to address the issues with NPEs, uh, everybody had a very different perspective uh, on what actually was an NPE. And, you know, we've got six people on the panel here. Uh, we might be able to come up with four separate definitions of, uh, of an MPE among the group. I'm not sure if we could get it down that small or not. Um, so I don't think there's any question that they will be here, uh, both because of inability to actually do anything about it and, you know, throw into that actually trying to do anything legislatively, I think, uh, since nothing else that's even simpler. Uh, can get done in Congress these days. It seems like uh, that's beyond uh, too much to hope for. So the cynical perspective is they're going to be around because even if we decided we wanted to do something about it, I don't think we could at these days. Thank you. I think they'll be around too. And so what kinds of things can we see for the future? Well, one of the things that we could see for the future is looking at the two things that really drive this, which is a high transaction cost and a high risk of being wrong in assessing whether you're going to win or lose. And until we deal with those two issues, I think that we'll be, um, we'll be plodding along pretty much as we are. And the only way that I could see to address that, obviously the uh, America Invents Act gave us more opportunities to uh, question uh, patents that were not uh, perhaps as valid as people would like them to be, but the, the resounding uh, response that I've heard to that is that it's not going to be a particularly workable solution at the patent office once all of these cases start coming up and the patent office isn't really equipped to deal with either the volume or the types of activities, the investigatory activities that would, that would need to be done there. So that's probably not the solution. And along the remark that Rob made in terms of what kind of, uh, of regulatory activity, um, it, it does seem to be uh, the perception of many people that the social good is being outweighed by the costs that are being imposed by some kinds of activity. I don't know that anybody has really been able to define where the line should be drawn, but there are some places where it doesn't work very well at all, and there are some places where the, the, the cost seems pretty reasonable. And I, I think that thoughts along those lines, along the lines that an antitrust regulatory type of organization would have, looking at the differences between simply acting alone 
or asserting something that is previously existing and defined, as opposed to putting together uh, a method of doing business or a, um, or a collection of particular patents in such a way that uh, the ultimate effect is not very fair to the people who are uh, participating in the system. I, I think that's probably where the, the discussion will go. Thanks. John, comments? Uh, yes, of course. Um, <laughs> asking a professor whether he or she would. has comments is always <laughs> sort of, you know, you know the answer before you ask the question. Um, I think NPEs will be around in, in, in five years. Uh, things don't change that quickly in patent law or in law in general. And I think there are two major trends in our society, not just in patent law, but in our general society that have been going on for probably centuries now that suggest that this is going to grow. One is increasing specialization in terms of businesses or workforces. Um, that is, uh, has traditionally led to you know, the creation of, of, of very specific market niches uh, that then become whole industries, essentially. Uh, so that, I think, is something that is uh, likely to occur. And indeed, I think a lot of the reforms, especially the opening of this immense and complex agency process, is actually going to be require more specialization in enforcing patents so that a large corporation if it, or any corporation that is interested in doing business is going to say, well, you know, this thing is just, it's very hard to understand. We need a specialist. And we also need to know that the specialist is giving us accurate information, which, and one way to do that is to just simply sell the right to the other party. I mean, it's, if you go to a lawyer and say, you know, gee, is this good? And, the, you know, can I, can I succeed on this claim? And the lawyer says, oh, of course, I think so, and I'll charge you a thousand an hour in the meanwhile. <laughs> you might worry that the person has this tremendous self-interest that they're going to be making legal fees off of you in the meanwhile. One way to make sure that the lawyer is, is giving you an accurate representation of your chances is to just simply sell the asset to them. And I think that that, um, inc that actually is a... Uh, is one mechanism. And then the second major trend, which has been going on for at least a century, is simply better and better and better data. Um, and that's going to hopefully lead to more liquidity in this market in general, in the sense that you'll be able to say, look, I've got this invention. I'm not good at, you know, finance or angel inventors. That's not my thing. I just, you know, I just work in the lab here. I want to sell it off. And that person will be able to have their invention evaluated in a more accurate way. I mean, that's part of the information revolution that we are v still very much on the cusp of. I mean, information is, we still have incredibly bad information about major important decisions that we make, but it's improving all the time. And I know Rob actually talked a little bit about his consulting. He's being modest. He's, he's worked on sort of the cu very cutting edge of this, of trying to create really solid metrics that evaluate patents in a very rigorous way. But I think he'd be the first to admit that it's in, the infant, it's in its infancy, um, this whole attempt to, to, to try to come up with good metrics uh, is, in the, um, uh, is in its infancy. I will say that um, since the other side said, you know, some uh, things about somewhat favorable to alienability and other things like that, I will say there is something different about, about non-practicing entities, which we really didn't get into, because it really goes to a fundamental, very fundamental issue. And here I'm going to be a little anti-NPE, slightly, um, but I'm going to, and I'm going to encourage you to, to raise this argument. I'm writing a paper right now that's looking at an old doctrine called the Paper Patent Doctrine. Very interesting doctrine that, that we've gotten rid of because we went to this theory that disclosure was the quid pro quo of the patent system, and not just any disclosure. It was the disclosure in the paper, the disclosure that's required by the statute, which is the disclosure in the patent document. Um, because of that, this, this theory that paper patents were worthless uh, <coughs> has withered and died. Um, in the late 20th century. But it used to be a very vibrant doctrine. It still has strong Supreme Court precedent behind it. And it, it in fact, is, I think, prone for a revival in the sense that modern theories about the transfer of information recognize that giving people a sheet of paper and saying, there, now you've got it, is not the way information is 
uh, transferred. Information transfer is very hard. And a business that actually goes out and makes a product and develops a product is something that is making a richer disclosure to the world than just something that's languishing in the, paper, the patent office's uh, uh, boxes. We used to have that doctrine in our patent law. And we didn't have a good theory to justify it. But now we have better theories about the law and economics of, of information transfer. It's primed to revive it. And if we don't revive it, then, then we get patent trolls of the, of the worst variety of the, of the people who, who create something and wait for other people to develop the industry. And the people who develop the industry, they're the real creators of the practical information. We used to penalize those people with this doctrine. It was not an absolute prohibition. It didn't say you couldn't sell your patents. It didn't say anything like that. But it was a very important doctrine. I think that should be revived. I'm writing on it. If you're litigating against a, a, an NPE, you should cite these cases and argue for a revival of it. And you, you know, I don't know what the Federal Circuit will do with the doctrine, but it's still got Supreme Court precedent. And in 2003, I said, you know, the, the, the obviousness doctrine was prime for reform, and, and it was. Um, and this is another area where I think it's prime for, uh, for reform. And indeed, the, the best, uh, I'll just close with this last point, which is that the, 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 the reason why I love this old doctrine is because um, there's a great quote from one of my current colleagues from, from the 1970s, one of my older colleagues at UVA. And he said, uh, he was writing on the law and economics of information, and he said, well, there's this theory that, you know, information just transfers very easily. And he said, that's insane insanity to any teacher who has spent the entire semester giving the people the book he wrote, trying hours after hours, meeting in office hours, and then after all the information should have been transferred, after all this labor, we read the exams. <laughs> <laughs> Eric? Yeah, so um, they'll, they'll be around in five years. I think primarily because the smart companies um, out there are realizing that it's a better outsource solution for them. Um, I, I can't tell you, HP is the exception. And as a matter of fact, I think HP will change their doctrine in the next year as well. Right now they've got it, I think, at a three-year limitation if you acquire a patent from them that you can't assert offensively. But, the, you know, the rate of the conversation at the edges of getting rid of that policy. But, you know, Microsoft sells, um, uh, Symantec sells, Delphi, General Motors, Ford. It's just, it's, it's a phenomenon. And they're not selling like little bits and pieces. They're selling en masse because it's incredibly expensive for Microsoft to maintain that 40,000 patent yeah. portfolio. And I think that they'll just say, hey, is it a solution for every patent? No, but what they're gonna say is for this large collection of them, this is pretty good. And if I'm Microsoft and I wanna be sticking my finger in Google's eyes, you know, I can do it. And oh, by the way, I'll get this guy to do it because he's actually pretty good at it as well. And it's just sort of a, a perspective that they take. The, the thing I think is really interesting, though, is um, I spent a lot of time in Europe and China, about uh, half the year, maybe a little bit more, almost three quarters of the year now. And Germany has the most <coughs> efficient system. If you haven't read right. about it, you should. It's, it's, it's incredible. The uh, Nokia Apple uh, file, um, I was working with Blair <coughs> on that one, and literally they had four cases going, and it was just this brutal fight. It was about that big. And I was like, you know, in the States, this, this room would right. be filled with right. paper, and, you know, with nothing get done. So incredibly efficient, as you'd expect of the Germans. Is it the best system? I don't know, but I think it's pretty neat, and that's something that we should look at mm -hmm. in the United States. Um, China, they're gonna kick our butts. They, they, they get it. Uh, they're, they're, I was over there about uh, a month ago, going through Shanghai, and um, the, uh, one of the ministers said to me, um, you know, we won't be the low-cost producer forever. And I was just like, oh my God, we, 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 we can't even get that idea through to people in the United States, and they're thinking it already. Well, they still are the low-cost producer. Um, the system that they've adopted is close to Germany's, not, 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 not quite dead on, um, but if you're in the IP business, you can get approval to do business there in under two months. Our approval took even less time, um, and in the past, if you were non-IP business, maybe it takes you a year or whatever to get through all the approval process, so they, so they, so they completely get it. The more frightening depart development from my perspective is what's going on in France. So um, France is competing with uh, the UK and Germany to have this, uh, I don't know what to call it, the European Patent Court, for lack of a better name. So they just adopted new, within the last year, they've adopted new rules, and the Paris court system has become this specialized court where all patent cases are heard. Um, and then sort of you say, okay, well, that's an interesting development. Over and above that, uh, CDC, which is their largest, uh, really a government venture capitalist, 
uh, just launched a group called France Brevé, um, and they're funded with, I think, 250 million euros a year. And what they're doing is, is they're running around the world uh, buying patents up to protect um, uh, French industry. Um, so they're doing something called Galileo. It's just this fascinating project, and their, their thinking is light years ahead of what we're doing in the United States, right? So in the, U in the U.S., you've got, you know, Senator Leahy, who I'm sure is a fine man, standing up and, you know, pounding the table for a company that he wanted to wipe out 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, that, that's sort of interesting, and the AA came at it from a, a, a curious perspective, but I think it probably ended up roughly in the right place, although a bunch of it's not going to work. Um, but the more important thing that needs to happen is, is we need to start watching what these other countries are doing and start saying, uh, you know, this is a pretty good system. We might want to adopt pieces of that here, and we might want to change that mentality a little bit and start thinking about how we're going to protect our SMEs um, because the rest of the world is way, way ahead of us. Thank you, Eric. Go ahead, John. I just wanted to say that, uh, yeah, I, I, I think I could be the only one up here that says I don't think they're going to be around in five years, but I don't think that'd be the prudent thing to say. So I'll say they'll be around in five <laughs> years. And uh, the uh, uh, I believe in our system of government, and I hope that it incents and increases the efficiency of our uh, patent system, patent markets. I think, I mean, I think we all come at it from a biased perspective, but specialization sounds like a good thing to us uh, I, I would be in favor of specialization the regulatory agency I'm, I'm not sure is a is a good idea I'm and, and let me let me preface this because if I look this way instead of it, it if I look this way I see that I'm I'm not the thought leader these guys are the thought leaders and all this I'm, I'm I, I'm, I'm not qualified to be up here talking to you guys about these things. So I'll, I'll defer, as Hal Heflin would say, uh, I'll defer to my distinguished colleague from Virginia. But uh, they, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I hope that we have a specialization. But I think the first, the first uh, I issue that we need to address is the, the patent office and the seriousness of the property right that they are issuing. And I think that uh, Judge Michelle and his work has been vital in that. I think that uh, John makes a good point about better data and better tools. If you really look at this, when once these things were put on the internet and more searchable, and the more things that have been done with the word searching, the more uh, the more of a market that you've had for these things. So, I think that it'll be here in five years, but I think it's evolving. So it'll be interesting to see what's here in five years, and probably be a good employment for everybody here in the room. So, uh, thank you very much. I, I have a couple comments I'd like to add. I. I had a trial over in Germany, and um, I mean, I think NPEs will be here for sure in five years and probably, you know, in the next hundred years, as long as we stay with uh, the litigation system we have here compared to a country like Germany. I mean, I ran a litigation in the United States at the same time was going on in Germany, and uh, it was so much more efficient in Germany. There was no discovery, uh, and that to me is the big hammer. I mean, when you in the practical world, when you represent a client against an NPE, it's the litigation costs that cause the settlements more often than not, and you don't go to trial. And it's because of, you know, all the discovery costs and things like that. Well, in Germany, you go in front of the judge. Uh, I had a translator whispering to me through like a horn what was going on, and the judge looks at the patent. The, the attorneys make an argument. It's a three-judge panel and it's sort of like an appellate argument and all the attorneys are jumping on the desk of the judges and pointing things out and have models there and then the judges issue a decision and uh we won uh thank goodness but uh i i don't see how NPEs can really flourish outside the united states because they don't have the same legal system we have with the hammer of the threat of legal costs i mean i just don't see it expanding to <coughs> simply litigating in there because the costs are just they're just not there um, the other practical consideration is if you guys can come up with some valuation tool for patents that is foolproof and it is certain I love it because there's there's not a in probably a month or two that goes by where a, a client comes into me and says what's the value of this can you you know I want to go license this I want to go sell it and you can go to uh, consultant A and get one value. You can go to consultant D and get value that's 20 times as much, and they're all sort of supportable. And I don't see any, I, I've been doing this for 25 years. 
I mean, we can, you can go to trial, you can hire an expert that's going to do the same thing. And I don't, I don't see, think there's any real valuation system out there today for valuing pens. I, I mean, I'm, I might be ignorant there, but I really don't think so. I mean, I can look at the number of claims I have, whether they're broad, you know, whether there's file wrapper or estoppel, whether I, you know, uh, you know, a lot of our pens are also written these days, talk about information disclosure with litigation in mind. We try to write patents that are going to create uncertainty for our, our competitors. We don't want them to know exactly what our invention is. We want it to be vague. We want it to be very broad. And all of our, you know, really good lawyers are taught. They follow the case law. They write the patents to not talk about the prior art, not explain what the invention is, but keep that thing as vague as possible. So I can create uncertainty so when I go out and sue somebody, I can get a settlement quick. But, so those are some practical considerations in my view, of this whole uh, situation. I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to that tool. I love it. <laughs> if I were to predict some of the things that will come in the future, uh, the damages area and the valuation area is certainly one of those areas. And the fact that we see from the Federal Circuit this increased focus on what the consumer thinks they're purchasing. So if the invention is driving the sale of a product, that's very significant. If the invention is not driving the sale of the product, then it seems to be much more insignificant. So I think one of the tools that will be used more and more are surveys, just like the surveys are used in the trademark area. And if you, if you go to the people, that, that might be the ultimate mm -hmm. measure of what this thing is actually worth in the marketplace. And I, I share your view of the, the multinational litigation and we were working with a company that had collected some patents and was enforcing them and we were looking at the United States as being a good place to uh, use as the enforcement tool because of the higher damages awards and the courts were moving pretty quickly and it evolved over time to be a more Eurocentric situation where the German courts were faster, were more predictable in terms of enforcing rights that you thought that should be enforced and much less expensive. So I think that one of the issues that certainly drives the um, organizations and lawyers to take on these cases, of course, is you know, whether you can do a contingency fee arrangement. I think some of the European countries are less ready for that. And I think that the damages that the, the, the foreign courts are willing to right. award are much less, and so I think that those two phenomena have caused that the activity that we've we've been involved in to be very U.S. centric. So I think it'll be interesting to see how all those things move as we watch people um, in this marketplace. Yeah, and then you have the U.K. system. I mean, I know there's always a, been a debate through history how far to extend 285, and should we go to a system where the loser pays? legal fees. I mean, that debate is, you know, is flamed up and down through the years that I've been involved with this business. So, yes, sir. My name is Michael and I'm not a lawyer. Great. <laughs> But I am a techie, and I've been a tech, techie manager, and I have even have a couple of inventions. I wanted to respond to your comment about what we need is some process for evaluating inventions. And I think that's a pipe dream. Um, in my experience, um, I see wonderful ideas, but they don't necessarily get to the marketplace, and the people who develop the marketplace 
really determine the value. Um, and wonderful things can seem great, but they never can get to the marketplace, or they may be great, and another invention eclipses it in the marketplace. So I would suggest that you not keep spending time running down that path. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm about to... Uh... I'm about $20 million into it, so if you don't mind, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> Somebody, somebody's going to, I mean, look, I, it, 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 there's nothing, it's a bunch of unstructured data. It, that's all it is. And if you, if you take a step back, and again, we're trained to see things as unique, but if you take a step back, it's just a bunch of unstructured data. And if I can figure out how to sort of take that unstructured data and match it up with a ton of other data out there that's available and somehow spit something out that looks like it. Is it going to be a Black-Scholes pricing model? I think eventually. Right away? No. But at least even if I could tier patents and say valuable, less valuable, worthless, that would be a huge advancement. So we're not just, we're not, I'm not trying to get to a point where I have a patent and I go, oh, that one's worth, you know, $747,000, you know, <coughs> that's what we're looking for. We're, 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 I mean, it, maybe you're doing something a little bit different, Robert, but we, we started on that path, realized that was a fool's game, um, and then started to say, okay, let, let's, let's tier. I think we've done a great job on tiering. I know John uses the tool. Um, that's not, so now the natural progression from that tiering is, is to start to put you know, parameters of value on it. But don't think of it as trying to say, you know, that patent's worth a specific you know, seven-figure number. Think of it as saying what we used to call reference ranges when I was an investment banker. You know, relative to others, this one's really good. That's that's a great first step in the evaluation step, and it's it, we're there now. Now the question is, can we get to the next step, where we sort of get into you know zip codes um, and you know proximate values, um, and that that, that that system's gonna that, that system's coming. It'll be here in the next five years. I think it's also just important to realize how primitive our technology is in this area. We really are at the very very beginning of the information revolution, and there are huge things today that, that, you know, we just have really, really poor data. And we, when we, we, people ask for estimates and we give them seat of the pants measures. And, and, and that may continue for years and years uh, for now. So, so people say, what are my chances of winning this litigation? That's something people ask their lawyers all the time. And, and there are new firms that are starting up right now uh, that are trying to provide more empirical data on to answer those questions. But all the technologies are in their infancy. But it's where we're going. Look, it's even happening in baseball, right? Mm -hmm. Read Moneyball <laughs> and say, look, everything is becoming about data. It's not a smallish trend and it's not just about patent law. But I agree with you, it is very, very much in its most primitive technology. Anybody else? My name is Michael, but I, I am a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, it seems like there's clear consensus uh, with the panel that the future of uh, MPs is clear that they will be around. But does that prediction change when you start considering about uh, specific uh, industries or technology areas? I think today you can probably make some generalizations about uh, uh, MPs and, and that there maybe there's a concentration or prevalence in certain technology areas, but going forward, I mean, is it right to think that MPs are going to be across all technology areas, you know, from pharmaceuticals, uh, chemicals, uh, biotech, uh, across to, to IT and, and, and other type of manufacturing? Yeah, yeah I mean, absolutely. Look, I, um, we're seeing it, right? The, 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 in the university market, for example, um, I, the tech transfer is going through a fundamental change. I think probably largely as a result what Intellectual Ventures did where they threw a bunch of money at the universities and started to say, hey, well, you know, we'll, we'll make it look like we're going to commercialize these, but we're really not. We're going to go out and license them. Um, and they took that infant step. And now some of the, um, some of the universities have gotten really aggressive um, on, you know, sort of selling, selling off patents. And, and I think that that becomes and they, they, they tend to have a much more medical device pharma focus, at least I think they do. Um, and so you're going, to see, you're going to see much more of that. But there's every CEO, I mean, <coughs> I'm meeting with industrial companies here in Cleveland, every CEO is saying, hey, I've got patents. How come mine aren't worth billions? Well, it's kind of a tough conversation to have with them. You have to explain that, you know, they're not all the same. Um, but I see 
at least in, you know my microcosm of the world, I, I see everybody from you know traditional Rust Belt companies all the way up to you know some very cool companies that are you know DARPA funded, um, looking at this and saying, hey, how can how can we make money with these as well? Which I think is a great thing because transaction volumes will explode, <clears throat> margins will go down, and the system itself will just become a lot more efficient. Yeah, I, I from my experience, what what I've seen is. If you have uh, uh, NPEs like industries where there's very repeatable, uh, for example, toothbrushes, toilet paper, sending texts, sending emails, repeatedly having hits on your uh, website where you, it's over and over and over and arguably a repeated infringement, those are the ones they love. And believe it or not, I was telling someone right now, we have a, a, a big client uh, that, uh, is a toothbrush manufacturer, and there are a ton of trolls in that area as well. So, I mean, that just goes to show you uh, what what sort of technology, and that's a pretty simple from basic technology. It's been around for hundreds of years. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would say any anywhere you have a complex, you know, multi-component product, you've got a good shot, and it's very likely that transaction volume involving patents will will go up, and so. In the loose terms we're now using, yeah, NPE activity will increase. But um, I think that licensing in the biotech, pharmaceutical, chemical areas is a little bit different. I, I don't think that you typically have the same large number of multi-patent portfolios that read on specific products. Now, in the biotech space, you know, you can have a nice portfolio that covers a particular tool or a screening method that's used widely. So there are some cases where you might have a fair number of, of sort of target licensees where your patents might read on them. And so there you might see some activity, but generally speaking, you know, for, especially for a, a, a specific pharmaceutical compound, there's only a few patents that cover that. I mean, that, that was what gave rise to the whole big, you know, holy war preceding the AIA was that the, the pharma chemical view of the world is sort of that single patents can be extremely valuable and you have to protect them very carefully and anything that undermines any uh, aspect of the patent right has to be, you know, is, is immediately suspect and that's why we had this split between tech, you know, loosely speaking, sort of West Coast tech and, and pharma. So, I mean, I think in those industries, you, you, you know, there's going to be more secondary market activity but I do think that it will, it will never approximate, it will never come near what we see in something where there's just hundreds of components and thousands of patents, you know, cell phones and, and uh, you know, servers, microprocessors, et cetera. I just think the nature of the product is different. And it's, I mean, just in terms of the search logistics, it's a lot easier to say how many patents read on this chemical structure. The tools are there. It just, it's not that hard to find them. And, you know, sometimes, okay, there's tools to help make a dosage form, and so in that sense, in the upstream, you have a little bit of a portfolio that might, but it's, it's fundamentally, I think, different. So I think the volume act of activity is going to be lower, I guess. Any other questions? Well, thanks. Thanks so much.